views and opinions expressed by the hosts do not state or reflect those of the company and its management. Furthermore, the assumptions, views, opinions, and insinuations made by the hosts or the guests do not reflect those of the show, the management, and the company. Identify. Discussed. Understand. Casting live from Manila, Philippines, we are Simply Security, helping you streamline security easily. Good morning, Philippines. Good, good morning, listeners. <laughs> and welcome to another episode of Simply Security, recorded live at an earlier time slot today, October 20, 2020. This is Miles Melia. And this is Eric Alindogan. Welcome to Simply Security. Helping you streamline security easily. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Miles. For today's episode, we're very happy. Uh, we're very excited, actually. We have a different topic. Very interesting topic. As uh, so today, we'll be having a very special guest to share his experience and learnings in our discussion this morning. Right. So let me introduce our guest for tonight, Dr. Matthew Thompson an author, journalist, SAS college lecturer, an adventurer, former professional firefighter, and more. Matt has written three books. The best-selling is My Colombian Death and its acclaimed sequel, Running with the Blood God, and the latest mm -hmm. mayhem, The Strange and Savage Saga of Christopher Badness Bip. A specialist in immersive reportage, Matt has dined in with Filipino guerrillas, sprinted from Iranian riot police, died in traumatic ceremonies with a Colombian shaman, toured Kosovo with Serb nationalists, wept inconsolably at a powwow in Oregon, and much else. One area close to his heart, which will be the topic for today's episode, is the Sulu Upper Archipelago of the Southern Philippines. The violent intrigues of which Matt has brought to life in long-form journalism, both in writing and for an ABC Radio National documentary. Matt is published by Australian Foreign Affairs, the Sydney Review of Books, The Weekend Australian, the BBC, the ABC, the Sydney Morning Herald, Days Plus Confused, and many others. Matt is also a retained firefighter and rescue operator with Fire and Rescue NSW or New South Wales for more than six years. Mm -hmm. Matt attended to all manner of emergencies ranging from house fires to road crashes. Matt has also taught graduate and undergraduate uh, graduate journalism at universities in Australia in, and Fiji, telling his students that if they will well and truly get stuck into writing, then there will be casualties. So ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> all the way from or Oregon, United States, it is my honor to present to you a very good friend, Dr. Matthew Thompson. Maga. <laughs> magandang umaga from the Philippines. Magandang gabi there in the U.S. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, the pleasure is all ours. Just for me to be able to start the, the, the discussion, let me ask you, Matt. What passion came first, being a firefighter or and a rescue responder or being a journalist, writer, and educator? Uh, a journalist came first. I, I, see. I, see, I, what happened was I became a, a newspaper reporter at the Sydney Morning Herald in, in okay. Sydney, in Australia, and was trained in shorthand and, and reporting, uh, long form writing, short writing. I and I started though to get kind of bored with uh, daily newspaper news. Mm, where the daily grind. Yeah, the daily grind and, and trying to find, uh, you know, a little spin on a story to keep it going and, and Put it out again no time to really contemplate think mm. um to to change my mind about something to to see how i really felt or what more emerged gradually so i, I started looking for um other things to do that would be more in depth and that's this is before i became a firefighter so i started uh going to the philippines um mm -hmm. philippines just at that time this is the very early 2000s it seemed an under understood, misunderstood, under understood, understudied, underexplored, underappreciated country. And mm. I started going there and it, 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 it blew my mind, basically. It, it's so fascinating, so complex, um, so hard to get a grasp on mm. um, that it drew me back many times. And 
you know, I'm looking forward to another opportunity to go. But anyway, so I, I, I started doing long form work from the Philippines. I'd go for a month at a time to, uh, to Mindanao and, and the Sulu. And, and then I, I left the newspaper and started doing a PhD or a doctorate. And okay. I moved to a small country town about two and a half hours north of Sydney. I, I did my doctorate like writing there and I traveled from there for journalism. But um, my, my, my wife um, was running voluntary art, like she was running free art classes for children in the town because there wasn't much going on. Right. And the fire brigade, the fire and rescue service, uh, started recruiting in the town at that time. They dropped in on their art class and they were looking for people who, could be, who were free during the day they had shortages during the day so she signed up and then um i thought hmm i i should probably <laughs> join her that looks, that looks kind of exciting because she'd been to the philippines we'd been there a few times then and became a firefighter uh so that yeah that came later but it was interesting the same some of the same things apply like in the philippines it seems it's essential to remain calm it don't is. panic and, it is. and Filipinos relax. are, yeah, <laughs> relax. <It's, laughs> Philippines is like a great lesson in, in keep your head together, keep smiling, just do what has to be done and yeah. um, don't freak and move out. move forward. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's what firefighting and rescue work is like. Stay calm, mm. see what I, has I've, to be I've done. I've never thought of that, you know, mentality actually. <laughs> that, 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 that's we, something that sometimes a, a, an outsider would actually point at at you just for you to be able to realize it. Well, it's, it's it, you know, the Philippines, people are um, flexible enough to cope with things. In Australia, if there's, you know, if, if a ATM stops working, there's people yelling and, and freaking out in the street <laughs> and things. You know? <laughs> so to do rescue work or something where everything fails machines fail the method you're using to cut someone out of a car doesn't work because of the angle it's on or it's up against mm -hmm. a, a tree or a wall or something or whatever you've got to keep thinking what's another way another method i can employ to get to the goal i want and and if that's survival in some situations so be it if, if it's um to set up a business with patchy infrastructure and things so be it as well you know or if it's in my case for with journalism it's like i need to get the story you know i, I need yeah. to uh, have some conversations with people in the abu sayyaf group mm -hmm. um I, I it may not happen in the expected way or you know one contact may not come through um i had to learn the filipino thing too of like no being a word no one uses yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're we're very uh, how can you say it? We we we're we're very uh, it's very difficult for us to say no. Um, so we 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 had a tendency to either say just nod our nod our head, <laughs> even if we don't really mean it, just for us to you know sometimes to to end the conversation. But it's just me being Filipino kicking the bucket like. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it, I mean, it was, I was frustrated at first in the Philippines with things like nobody saying no, even though the answer was really no, <laughs> um, things like that. But yeah, as I said, it, it's, it's so been hard a... to be honest sometimes. <laughs> yeah, right? but, it, I think but... It's, it's really more of like we, we, we're not trained or we're not used to, to delivering no. the bad message or, yeah. Yeah, or to say no. So. As it, a culture, it, I think. Yeah, and it, it, it's been a lesson in, in for journalism too, because in the Philippines, it's like to, to understand um, what's happening and what people are really telling you behind the mm -hmm. words and things. It's all a lesson in time, patience, and, and exactly. really, really listening and learning and absorbing mm -hmm. and, and getting rid of any kind of frustration or arrogance, um, you know, and, and judgmentalism about different states of play and different <laughs> cultures and things 
That's yeah. that's true. That's true, yeah. Matt. Because um, I I work as a journalist myself for a decade now, and whenever I interview people after a disaster, and you ask them how are you, they will always say I'm fine, even though at the back of okay. uh, at, at their back. Um, their houses are destroyed, they lost their property, but then they will smile and say, we're fine. Yeah. And it yeah. still divorce me until now. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the truth just seems to come out by spending as much time as possible in places and with people and, mm -hmm. um, and, and not imposing the story on it. The Philippines always used to have a story imposed on it for what I was reading in the outside world. It was, the Philippines was like this or like that. And I remember once before I, I came to the Philippines, a veteran old time international reporter said to me, you're going to the Philippines? What are you gonna do there? And I said, we're mm. gonna go explore the South and see what's going on. And, and he said, why? Who wants to read that? Like Philippines, Emil de Marcos's shoes, sex tourism. That's, they're the only two stories anyone wants to hear. Like Colombia, mm -hmm. cocaine or something, or, you know, like Japan, sexual fetishes and high technology. Wow. There's a maximum of two stories for every country in the Philippines is Emil de Marcos's shoes and sex Those tourism. stories that will sell, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I resisted that and um, hate that whole mentality. That's why I got out of the newspapers and things, you know. Oh, I see. Ooh, I mean, okay. I, know, I know that they're not all like that and, and so on, but they often are, you know, the, often very shallow. And you can't explain anything in the Philippines in 600 words or whatever. The <laughs> true. It's true. impossible. It's just mm -hmm. impossible, you know. The, it, by one thing, another thing the Philippines has taught me is that to simplify a situation is to distort it, you know, and to to end up with a misleading message from it. The, part of the part of the um, real story of the world, and not just the Philippines, is its complexity. Yeah. You know, and if you just pick out one strand um, and, and focus on that at the exclusion of the others, I, th I think that is what feeds ineffective, you know, failing or par only partially successful military mm -hmm. interventions at times, you know, that that overlook so much of the culture, that pick one group of people out and say they're the good guys or the bad guys or something and not There's see the connections. Kinds of characters. Well, yeah. I think uh, I remember one client, um, you know, uh, coming from a, a multinational company. Uh, this particular executive has been assigned to different parts of the world and, you know, um, was part of his function was to talk to people. And what he noticed about the Philippines was it was too complex because let's say if you go to Africa, there there, there may be like uh, issues, and you know some people will demand something, and then you just have to negotiate, and then it's 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 that the, you you have to move on to another chapter. In the Philippines, it's not always as it looks. Sometimes you know there there there's one story, and then. You, you have to look at it on, story. yeah, there, there's a different underlying stories. You, you, you have to, you know, to, to look at it in different perspective. And sometimes, you know, in business, you, you, you tend to look at the, the lesser evil or uh, try to maximize in what's the most optimized, you know, solution for this particular problem. So for, for some foreigners, like foreign investors, they, they, they look at it as uh, quite complex. It's interesting, it's challenging, but it's it's kind of mind-boggling, as you've mentioned earlier. So yeah. <laughs> Is it ever as it as it looks in the Philippines? I I don't know if I've come across anything well, that is ever as it looks. Yeah, but in in I don't know, but in a, a locals' perspective, I think it, it's programmed to us to to always look at it that way. But yeah. Um, you know, hearing it from an outsider's perspective, it, it's quite interesting. And it's like, you know, like what, what uh, this conversation and uh, the, the realization is like, yeah, I, I've never thought of that. But, you know, it, it well, makes us interesting. <laughs> well, the, the Philippines is another thing. Um, it's just how resilient and, and intelligent people are and mm. multilingual too. Like, you know, Hardly anyone I know in Australia, for example, speaks another language, but just about everybody I meet in the Philippines speaks yeah. two, at least two, maybe I, three. I, 
I speak uh, well I I understand six languages simply because my my parents are coming from different parts of the country uh but I could only like speak uh four languages like Miles and I happens to have the same uh aside from English and Tagalog we also speak Bicolano which is another major language and I think that's also uh one issue like uh regionalism is quite big in the Philippines uh only starting when, when we're talking about language we have like 400 uh languages or 200 mm -hmm. I, i'm not sure but in terms of uh, a dialect is a completely different thing dialects in the philippines like 4000 you may speak of the same languages but the dialect could also mean a different thing so That's true. yeah well, anyhow mm -hmm. no matt <laughs> i have to yep. yeah okay Miles, yep. thank you no matt you mentioned about your experiences or your decision to go to sudu now how do you prepare yourself in each of your field of works although there are let's say separate fields but somehow interrelated uh, specifically on your experience before going to Sulu, how do you maintain security mm. from the impeding re uh, risk when you went there for security a gradual thing the first time i took f fewer risks knowingly i suppose so the first time I was with the army and then the Marines that time right. and doing less independently than I have done on subsequent trips. So uh, I would make contacts first. And I remember before my very first trip, first, I think the first thing I, I did was get hold of a international crisis group report about oh, the okay. MILF and the and Jama Islamia. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this was in the aftermath of the Bali bombings of 2002 and, and some of the subsequent mm -hmm. attacks. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, joint kind of facilities and operations with uh, MILF and JI at the time and leading up to that. So I, I read that like many, like very carefully contacted the, the author of the report met him in, in Canberra in Australia. And then I had through a journalist friend, um, uh, a contact to, to Mr. Goetta, uh, oh. your boss. And <laughs> Hello. I didn't know this. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so when I arrived in Manila, like the, one of the first things I did was meet with Mr. Goetta and, mm -hmm. um, who who drastically kind of deepened my understanding of what risks I was taking that's <laughs> by just blundering <laughs> around down in the south. You know, like yeah. an idiot. Were you scared um, after knowing all all the information that you need? Yeah. But again it was like training in or eye opening experience for real politic or, or you know, realism what's going mm -hmm. on because mm -hmm. you know he would He'd give me sort of hypotheticals or examples. Of, say a Japanese company wants to uh, set up, a, operate a power station somewhere. They need to know what are the armed groups and organized crime syndicates around, what the political situation is locally as well, and uh, who is likely to be putting pressure on them for money right, or right. you know or threats or whatever, all this kind of stuff. And, and so Mr. Goetta, one thing he taught me was to put aside your feelings about these different parties to the mm. situation and instead treat it almost like a anthropological or a sociological thing where it's like this is yeah. the this is the wilderness or the urban environment that i'm entering like it's a system it's an ecosystem and to go into it you need to know what's there and and you know like if if, if i was to go into the forests here in oregon where there are some wolves and bears and places and things i, I don't like judge them like you're a right. wolf you're bad or something it's more like well what is how does a wolf operate um when do, when is it out when is it not you know what does it mm -hmm. want this kind of thing like it, it, it's interesting that you've mentioned it my my question for this particular segment is it's more on prior to you going to the philippines what were your first impressions your objectives in, in going there well, what were your your impression your first impression about the security landscape of the place that you're going to the first time is in the aftermath of the bali bombings and in australia the attention was very much on indonesia and yeah. chasing down ji people in australia gave assistance to Indonesia. Many, many reporters went over to cover operations against JI in, in Indonesia, like a police operations and things against them. And it seemed like nobody was coming to the Philippines, even though, you know, the training camps the that the MILF had, yeah, were in central Mindanao and elsewhere as well. But there was so much going on here. 
And there'd been uh, bombing campaigns and things here in the years before and at that time. I was, my, my mission that I set myself was to, to understand what was going on with JI and what was, what the peace treaty or the kind of ceasefire thing yeah, the, with the MILF the was yeah. and what the holes in it were. So, because it seemed to me, I couldn't understand why the MILF wasn't listed by the US as well as a prescribed terrorist organization, given mm -hmm. that they were directly working with JI. And when the MILF were under pressure militarily, um, there'd be bombs going off in Manila and things by JI people or JI trained people and, oh, um, I remember and other this, parts yes. of the country. Mm -hmm. So I, I, my mission was to uh, come down and physically see what was happening. I went to um, into central Mindanao and so I'd, I met with some MILF people um, who, you know, were very nice and polite and friendly and told me like, practically nothing <laughs> you know, they just want to chat nice, with you <laughs> yeah but I, I went all around Basilan at the time and i remember it was general braganza was the charge of things then and mm -hmm. i remember these things like that i found quite different to what i expected and interesting and kind of touching in some ways like at one stage mm -hmm. i think the military thought it had killed gaddafi janjalani oh, and okay. general braganza went to his parents house to see them and say i'm sorry for your loss we're all filipinos and mm, it's like i see such a different mindset even if it's theat you know theatrical or a little bit pr and so on right i still think it's a very like important gesture and there's something decent yeah. about that you know i mean my, i know you that feel it's unprecedented for uh, like a westerner coming in it's like oh my god really like that's just yeah. i would never expect the the u.s military or the australian military to go and and you know offer their condolences to the parents of someone they just killed after shooting mm -hmm. things it, it's, it's interesting yeah yeah it shows it shows what i started to see but didn't really know i was seeing it and didn't understand it for years and that's just how interconnected everything is so people are related in places that, who are on different sides of the conflict I think, yeah mm -hmm. and and not everybody wants to kill each other so part of the reason it seems that the conflicts can go on for so long and long and long is because people are not fighting to exterminate each other, you know, to, to yeah. just obliterate, wipe each other out, drive each other out, kill mm -hmm. everybody. It's one thing I've been, I was thinking after I went last time to Holo, to Salu and, and Basilan was what can appear to be instability from the outside can also be seen as stability. So, mm -hmm. you know, last time I was in Basilan, one of the police protecting me he said do you want to talk to i can't remember the abu Sayyaf commander's name but he he's wanted for beheading a whole stack of marines anyway so eventually this policeman said are oh, you trying to reach him well i'll ring him he's my cousin he's a great man <laughs> <laughs> rings him and he's on the phone like just like that and the policeman is protecting me from that guy that right. guy's you know his side is his colleagues everything how did that and make you feel alarmed and <laughs> of kind of like questioning in the last two weeks or three weeks you know, like, <laughs> where's your loyalty was i, was <laughs> I ever safe I, I don't know you know um yeah, yeah. and then they started I think saying yeah uh, i think that's also you know what makes it complicated or complex uh when we talk about you know, threat groups, because sometimes when you talk about threat group, most people look at it like sometimes plain criminals, like just one individual identity or one individual profile. Uh, this were in, you know, the, the, the understanding their interconnectedness, their relationships yeah, uh, comes so into play. And at the end of the day, this is actually what's more important rather than just looking at it. Yeah, it's not like black and white. Yeah. Not black and white. Well, you know, these people, police officers, family, the Abu Sayyaf guys, their families, they all have to keep living there. And, mm. and you know, I, I know that terrible things happen, murder, torture, you know, bombings and so on. But to march in and just ignore what's beneath the surface and uh, pretend that if you shoot a bunch of bad guys and all this problems are over, it's just farcical. It's like so much mm -hmm. more complex than that. So for example, another thing I've done uh, for more recent trips is, is uh, read as much history and anthropology as I could about yeah. the regions. And, th and this led me to a letter from i think it was leonard wood i think who's a was a u.s military consul of of um uh, mindanao and salu in the in salu in like the early 1900s 
and okay. he he wrote this letter to to Theodore Roosevelt, the president, saying that the Moros, all they need is one clean cut lesson, and there'll be no more trouble from them. Like just they, they there's continued fighting, you know, ambushes, insurrection, or whatever. But w if we deliver one clean cut lesson, then uh, the problem will be solved. You know. So then a few years later, there's the uh, crater massacre you know where the yeah. u.s killed like a thousand people Taosugs, uh, i think on on hollow the bud jow is it the mountain outside? yeah the bud yeah. yeah and and so there's your clean cut lesson and here and here we are like you know 100 plus years later and the same things so continue this, yeah. because yeah. It, there is no such yeah. thing as a clean cut lesson in in the deeply you know interwoven situation one thing that i learned too is that how important and powerful mayors and stuff are in political figures yeah yes in, in australia mayor is unless it's a major city and even then it doesn't really matter so much the state government's what matters <laughs> you know. mm -hmm. they have some but nothing nothing like the the, the sway and power in the philippines i i mean um i i think for for uh, an area like basilan or you know uh sulu or uh, some of the most controversial areas in the Philippines. It really takes uh, such influence and charisma for a person to 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 have that political position. So I think that's uh, when we when we do field works like this, uh, stakeholders are one of the things that we have to look into because you know sometimes they. They, they have the tendency to, 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 to decide how the, the social political dynamics mm -hmm. will be in a particular area. So that's, th th that's a good thing that you've actually raised that now. So. And Matthew, your experience in Sulu uh, is, was translated into a book that you wrote. We will talk more about that when we uh, write back after. <laughs> Want to learn about corporate security and risk management from industry experts for free? Check our latest MidDirect Touchpoint to learn more. MidDirect Touchpoint is Black Pearl's online webinar platform where security professionals and enthusiasts discuss relevant security frameworks, strategies, and issues. To register, check our LinkedIn account for the most upcoming topic and schedule. We are Simply Security, helping you streamline security easily. And welcome back. We have Dr. Matthew Thompson, author and journalist, discussing about his experience in writing about and being in Sulu, Philippines. And this is the segment where Matt will talk about his book. So le le let me start the, the, the segment, Matt, by asking, you've mentioned a lot about, you know, some parts of your experience, the things that you've encountered and the people that you've talked to when you went to, to, to Sulu and the Sila. Let's talk more on the challenges. What were the things, what, 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 do, what do you think were the major challenges that you've encountered uh, writing this book? And how did you manage to overcome it? Well, I should say my biggest piece of writing on, on that area is is novella length, but it's all online from the <laughs> Sydney Review of Books. So anyone can just go to that website and read it. And I can give you the links all afterwards to share with okay. everyone. But the story is called Don't Go to Hollow, which I kept getting told. So I had to go there. But <laughs> the, ch the challenges were uh, to not get kidnapped. Um, mm -hmm. Like personal security was, was overriding challenge. And apart from that, it was to try to get honest, objective view and account and information because so much is duplicitous or people just don't tell the, the truth if they've got vested interests and they're protecting their their money or power. The, you know, same anywhere in the world. Uh, people with money and power want to keep it and mm -hmm. the truth is not so important as them keeping it. And anyone who's like looking into things um, that might reveal uh, dirty sources of money or power is you know faces either being ignored in a in a like highly ordered country or being shot in some parts of the world so mm. i'd be very careful and, and then kidnapping as well um yeah 
yeah it's can, one, so one big thing. all those years ago the first time i met um uh mr goetta of business profiles you know, he, he gave me this wonderful kind of uh, quick rundown over dinner in Makati. He sort of leans in and, and says, you see this restaurant? How many exits are there? I said, I don't know. He said, you should know. Like, if someone comes through that door, where are you going? He went on and on. It was like really, really useful. Yeah. So all that stuff has uh, stayed with me over the years. I think that's that's one thing that we've also, um, you know, at least in the, the, the security industry, uh, it, it's very important to 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 imagine or simulate possible scenarios, like uh, security scenarios, because that's that's the only time that you're able to to think of what you could do. But you know, sometimes it, when when you're facing an emergency, sometimes you you either you get stuck, you just got nailed on where you at, and you're just waiting for something big to happen. That's why in security trainings or orientations that we, we usually conduct. It's very important to have that mindset, like a quick mindset, a quick decision making. But let me um, uh, ask you another question, Matthew. You've mentioned in most of your social media accounts, as well as your some of your interviews, that you 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 grew like a, a certain interest in 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 Sulu or in in the Philippines. And I, I I suppose that up until now, you're you know you're monitoring it or you're 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 checking on it from time to time. But how can you describe the security landscape from the time that you've been there from the now? So I went at each end of the American military intervention from early in it in the early 2000s to just after it finished in about, what, 2014 or something. And this was like, uh, basically 12 years U.S. military intervention in Basilan and with troops in Holo as well, uh, special forces advisors. And a lot of money spent, a few Americans killed in, in bombings. And uh, when I first went early in the intervention, the place was uh, prone to ambushes, IEDs. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, uh, you know, you couldn't drive between c- cities without a heavy escort or mm-hmm. totally anonymously. Um, and kidnapping was a risk. So, and the Abu Sayyaf were, you know, uh, when I first went there, I was told there were about 300 left or something and all this. And then... 14, uh, sorry, Up until years, now, that's the same estimate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 12 years later when I went there, th- it's the same estimate. How many are left? You can't drive between places without a heavy escort. Um, yeah. The IEDs and ambushes still happen. Bombings still happen. Um, assassinations still go on. So it was, there were signs of, of development, like more kind of roads and, and some markets and, and, you know, things like that, bits and pieces mm-hmm. of stuff. But the security environment was, was still very dangerous. And there were some encounters with many soldiers killed at both ends of this. It seemed like the intervention had, like, I, I didn't experience any real difference between the two times, you know, like, mm. it's, it seemed the same. It's the same. Well, and, and, let me ask yeah. the question for, for Miles this time around. Like, being your, being a journalist yourself, let's say the company that you've used to work before ask you to cover Sulu or Basilan. What, would you take it? Well, I- I would, I'm interested, but Mm -hmm. if, okay, let's put this into perspective. I work with a company where there are two reporters that was, that were kidnapped. So Mm -hmm. after those things happened, they forbid reporters to go into these Mm -hmm. conflict areas. However, um, I understand what Matthew is saying. It's kind of uh, bizarre to me, Matthew. I'm looking at the Sydney Review of Books you have five installment of the Don't Go to Sul- uh, Hulu. I reviewed it and, I, and, I, and, and it came to me that even though the title is Don't Go to Hulu, you're trying to explain why people should not go there and at the same time, pick up the story that most people will tend to simplify things the mm. way they, they were communicated to them. But as a fellow journalist, let me ask you, is this worth it? It, it is. I, I think for in a limited way. So in other words, I, I do these trips for a month and take my time getting to know people, getting to you know and to trust yourself. a few people. Yeah. And then and then ease in, spend some time and come out and not not stay for six months or something. But but then to come back again, um, see the same people again who'll trust me more. 
um, who I'll know better. And to me, it's like a multi-decade project, you know. My first mm, stories to yeah. me seem like kind of naive right. and, and wrong in mm. lots of ways, but you have to start somewhere, you know. As my coverage of the Philippines has gone on, I've, I've come to, to see it's not what it appears a lot of the time and it's much more complicated. But, but yeah, because of the risk of kidnapping or worse, I don't want to like push it too far. Yeah, so I, I go for a month, which is has its hazards and things, but it's better than a week or better than, you know, a couple of days or something. And then I keep reading, thinking, so like in my lead up to the last one, I, I binged on history and anthropology and I came across all these studies of the, the culture of Taosilg and Yakan people. Yeah. And what, it, what, what that did for me, which is in that, don't go to hello story was this the, the usual uh, the usual statement that you hear whenever you tell people that you're going to hello sulu uh, in the philippines it's people just look like i need to be committed to a mental hospital if i say <laughs> i'm going to there like you mm-hmm. must be completely insane yeah you have a death wish you're 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 mm. mad you know. <laughs> Or they tell me that the um, if it's up north, they tend to say that Muslims are bad and things. Yeah, you know, I get a lot of there's a lot of there's as many stereotyped versions of reality within the Philippines about other parts of the Philippines as there mm-hmm. are outside the Philippines about the Philippines. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's a you're changing the narrative. I'm yeah. not really changing, but more of giving clearer picture or supporting well, at the same time debunking. I, I guess <laughs> for for my, my my last question for this particular segment goes to both of you. Well, they, they, they always say that interview or elicitation is an art because it's a skill set that not all people have. But for me, doing field work, I think what is more important, even prior to the interview, is building the trust. And imagining myself doing the kind of field work that, let's say, Matthew is doing for, uh, for uh, an area wherein trust is not a luxury. Like most people will always be suspicious of strangers. Most there's people no formula. Will, yes, there, there, there is no formula, and people uh, looks at you always, you know, uh, as uh, as an outsider. <laughs> and not only in the Philippines, but all, all um, across all the places that you've been through, Matt. How do you build trust? How do you decipher whether or not the information that are given to you are true or not? And how do you maintain? Um, how do you build networks? In, in, in areas where in, you know, network building is quite difficult. Well, mm-hmm. for, for trust, I find that sharing experience with people is vital. So like the people that I that help me in these places that I deal with, they're often taking risks for me. You know, they're, mm-hmm. it's, they, it'd be much yeah. easier for them and safer for them often if they did not help me or anything. So I, I really respect that. And I, I, I try to um, put myself in their shoes and um, mm-hmm. if there's things I can do with them and, and not like just get them to come to my hotel or something but go to them go everywhere right. and you know, sometimes that's not possible or practical but as much as it is po- practical and possible I do it and and so I go hiking or patrolling with military people um, to, to just show that I, I like I'm I want to feel what it's like too you know and 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 not and not just um, be riding from a great distance, but to see the real challenges and, and the joys. In the, to, in the inside. And the, yeah, mm. and, and, and the, with the food and, and like eat, eat what people eat places and eat, breathe the air they breathe and, and uh, meet who they meet and just not have an agenda as an interview with everything, but just soak up the, the local air and culture and everything and, and learn as much as I can of the of the language and words and things, which is mm-hmm. never very much, but it, but it matters to people to, to make an effort to kind of like get in the flow of things. And then if there's going to be formal interviews, to do that later on. But but basically, most of my interviewing is, is on the go with people in them doing what they do, not not like sit down in this room now and mm. I'll turn my tape recorder oh, I see. on. I it's see. more like in their most we're, we're comfortable. Out, yeah, um, it was in action. And you see more about people when they're in action. Like, right, you know, right. more of their personality comes through, their character, and, and you can start to see if they're 
a bit apprehensive at the security situation as opposed right. to someone sitting in office somewhere saying everything's fine. So um, is that what you call shared experience? Shared experience, yeah. Like I'll take, I always trying to take the risks that they'll take. Yeah, I think what Matthew is saying is for you to build trust into an environment or to an area where security and the tension is obvious, you have mm -hmm. to um, you have to experience things from the locals with the locals first, have mm -hmm. that shared experience, mm -hmm. and then sometimes just be with them with no agenda. Yeah. yeah, no, that's right. No agenda, just learn. Like one of the most important things is to listen to people, I think. So because the stories are there too. They are there. Their stories are there. But if, if you just walk in with like a set of questions that you want answered from your understanding mm. from the outside and, and people right. will often give you that, like they'll, they'll answer those questions, but you, that's not really the story or anything. My kind of goal is to understand the world and life and the forces mm -hmm. at work on people and inside people and everything, and not to impose a story from the outside on it. When I was starting out, though, it, it was, I suppose, to impose a story, you know. From your, from your perspective. Yeah, mm -hmm. but my time in the Philippines has taught me to try to, you know, as much as possible, push that aside and just listen, learn, absorb, and, yeah. and learn from the people in these places. And I'm just thinking. Really like. I'm just thinking, like, uh, for, for for instance, for Miles, do you think Filipinos are more open to you know to, to trusting foreigners than locals? This is actually like an when you do your interviews, because this is something that we've observed. Like, for for instance, I, I I've worked with so many indigenous people in the north, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what what we've observed is that um, the local communities are more trusting. This is just my hypothesis. They're more trusting <laughs> with foreign nationals in giving out information rather than their fel fellow Filipinos. Fellow Filipinos. Mm -hmm. I, think it I think it depends. It's, it's so okay. hard to have one conclusion whether certain groups will open up to a fellow Filipino or not. Mm -hmm. Because in my area, if you don't speak their dialect, they were like, I will have no effort of speaking yours. But there are also certain groups where in, you know, when they see a, a foreigner, they will show how hospitable they are. They will tend to right. overshare, have many stories, even if they're not that interesting. But I think it's an advantage if you're a foreigner. There's some advantages to it. And uh, disadvantages will be like, they will try to fool you try to yeah. make up stories um, to your um, to your pleasure or because yeah. they of know course, what you want. We're not encouraging foreign nationals to go to, to, to Sulu or to Basila. For your experience, Matthew, is this something that you've also noticed or you've you, you, you've experienced? Yeah, definitely. He's trying to think of even the early trips to Basila. Like, because sometimes on the, those trips, there were, I can't remember what the incident had been, but some Filipino journalists popped up, but they seem to be under pressure to just deliver very short, snappy news bites and things. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Because immersive journalism, like I do with the month in the place and, and, you know, staying with everybody and doing all that, that's what I left the newspaper world to do because the Sydney Morning Herald wouldn't let me do that either kind of thing, you know, right. like, mm -hmm. this is, this is like a vocation for me to, to get in there and and mm -hmm. understand J journalists are under hellish time pressures and cost pressures and you know like it's just the business model doesn't support what i do unless it's yeah. for a much more in-depth thing like a book or it's something academe academe yeah right? um i would like to add something when matthew was saying about how he was experiencing things with the locals it's different if you're in the television or if you're if there's camera mm. involved wherein mm -hmm. the setting will totally be different if they see a camera. Right. But if they see a person just talking to them, they feel normal. They feel... Yeah. Um, they oh, so so different, like that they're more cautious. That's yes, true. like t t today, for example, in Oregon here, in Southern Oregon, where I am, I was uh, with a, a camera operator, filmmaker, d doing a uh, doc, working on documentary. We spoke to some homeless people, some of the homeless camps here. And again, there's a, a camera comes out, people disappear, you know, yeah. mm. they, like, and others come they forward change. and they're not, yeah, they're they behaving. change. And the people who want to come to the camera aren't necessarily the people you want to talk to. And right. the people who run away probably are, you know, yeah. so 
it changes. There's all kinds of reasons why, why that's the case. You know, like a lot of Filipino journalists are murdered. It's probably a bit more daunting um, for the people who do that kind of thing to, to knock off, you know, uh, a, a foreigner. It, just more repercussions happen, you know, like the more heat yeah. will come down on them, etc. So it's more dangerous for Filipino journalists. The toll has been very high. Other factors like business models, who's funding the kind of journalism, how, how deep can you go or can afford right. to? Plus, uh, Filipinos are going to be in more danger a lot of the time, yeah. you know. Less of a kidnapping target perhaps sometimes, but not, not necessarily, but definitely more of a, a target for you know, assassination. When I enter the, the journalism industry, there are three things that my professor told me. Journalists in the Philippines are low paid and journalists are being killed. So why go to journalism? <laughs> but mm. as your, uh, the reason you stated earlier, there are many reasons to be in this kind of industry. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for your sharing. And we'll be having a quick break. When we return, Eric and I will be reading some of our listeners' insights and questions here in Simply Security. Helping you streamline security easily. Did you want me to this stay for the, the part with the yes. listeners? Or? Yep. Okay. Yes, yes. Corporate risk and security management solutions. Business Profiles Incorporated. Our business is to keep you in business. Black Pearl Consultancy. Bringing intelligence analysis, travel security, and business continuity support to new heights. Black Pearl Consultancy, intelligence for smarter decisions. BP Argus Security Services Incorporated. For holistic industrial protection, BP Argus Security Services is committed to the highest standards of providing effective security manpower services. Blue Four Security Services, the security manpower of choice by many companies and organizations in the Philippines. Blue Four Security Services, delivering quality protection and service integrity to your corporate needs. And we are back. We would like to thank Chronicle Data and Research. Chronicle Data and Research Solutions provides comprehensive corporate inquiries and background checks for businesses and organizations. Chronicle Data and Research Solutions delivering concise, factual, and relevant service through expertise and trust. Yeah, and we also want to thank Silverpoint Training and Development, the knowledge and skill building arm of Business Profiles Incorporated, offering the latest and most practical and strategic briefings and corporate trainings in the field of business security. All right, we're back. So for today, we were going to entertain some questions coming from our audience and some of their comments. So do we have a live question? We don't have yet, but we'll we just happen have to, we're just asked. going to read some of the questions. This is from Tom Pecora. This is for Miles, actually. So do reporters <laughs> yeah. seek personal safety training before they go to more dangerous locations in the Philippines? Oh, yeah. There are some organizations, non-government, and uh, in our company, we do have that as well. It's just some sort of a preparation because, for instance, we have to identify the risks as well before going into those areas. So it's not just a one-time thing of safety training. It is uh, safety training and then afterwards a follow-up and even before going to the actual place. They have to be the, not, not some sort of a devil's advocate, but just they remove your enthusiasm to go to the areas and cover the story. So yeah, thank you so for that, Tom. For my, my follow-up question for that, coming from the same question, for Matthew, when you went to Sulu and Basilan, I, I think you, you came there as an individual. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I've, I've, or as um, part of an organization. As an individual writing a book or with a commission for a story, but never as an employee of an organization. So what were the, the, the personal security trainings or briefings that you took? Well, you've mentioned uh, some earlier, but anything formal? No, no. I've, I've just been an idiot and and uh winged it so <laughs> <laughs> i mean i've had like, I, I had a i had a ex-army friend take me out into the forest in australia and teach me how to take cover and move under fire so he would disappear and i'd keep walking down a track or something then he would like let off some shots and 
I had to hit the ground and move and try to judge where it was coming from and all this kind of thing. So I've had, had training, but it's more of informal. Yeah, experiential yeah. Experiential training, yeah. But after mm -hmm. I started doing it, so this like too late for the early trips. You know, that stuff can be very expensive in Australia, those courses. My curiosity is greater than my self-preservation. We have another comment. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's a question coming from Stephen Cutler. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Stephen. So your Hello. comments about lack of difference in the security situation do the statements by ASG of allegiance to ISIS really make much of a difference? Some people say it's serious and a real game changer. Others say it's a way to push the American buttons to get more aid money. Others says that it's just the flavor of the moment to get attention and feel powerful and important. Where do you see this, uh, Matt? I've written a bit about this and in some ways... It was Jamaat Islamiyah before with money and bomb making expertise and so on. And then, you know, Al and Al Qaeda and Al Jamaat Islamiyah were affiliated with Al Qaeda and then yeah. uh, Islamic State later on. And it seems like it's, it's always someone. Unless there's a massive infusion of cash things, I don't see it making that much of a difference. And it, in some ways, um, I think of counterfeiting culture in the Philippines too. Someone can say they're with a group and they can be, uh, they can look like it, sound like it, have some links to the group, mm. but also just be acting. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and like right. it, it can be a, a, a domestic show as well because it impresses yeah. people who are impressed by that and they get more recruits by that. Sometimes it's partly true and partly not true. So mm -hmm. uh, Islamic State, encourages or has encouraged independent action around the world by people in its yeah. name. So whether or not to what degree the connection is formal is not the most important thing in the world. If the strategies change so that there's there's more suicide attacks, and I know there there have been some in recent years, but that would change things a lot, I think. And but I haven't really seen that. Like no one's blowing up in, in Manila with a backpack bomb, you know, killing themselves mm -hmm. in a train load of people, thank God. The takeover of by the Malte group. Before that, there was the siege of, of parts of Zamboanga City. So... Um, if you may, I, I just want also to give my perspective like as an analyst. I remember our conversation when you did the last time when we heard about the Abu Sayyaf pledging its Ba'i or its allegiance to the Islamic State. And one of the questions there was, will I Islamic State really recognize Abu Sayyaf, taking in consideration that they also have existing allegiance with Al-Qaeda back then? And I, I remember specifically what I've told you is that during that time, Abu Sayyaf was seen more of like a bandit group because there was like an ideological vacuum after its founder, Abdul Wajak Janjalani, died somewhere in, in 1999. And when his brother took over Gaddafi, he doesn't happen to have the same leadership and then at the same time religious background. So mm -hmm. most people look at Abu Sayyaf and then you could also see the transition in terms of their operation because before, during Abdul Wajah, most of the, the attacks were, you know, religious in nature. They were like bombing cathedrals, they were mm -hmm. attacking missionaries. And then you see the, the, the significant... perspective. Yeah. So there is a significant transition with Gaddafi because this is the time when you're kidnapping came in, the foreign national kidnappings were big, and that's the time that they're really getting much attention. But in 2014, that was significant because this is the time where in you see Isnolon Hapilon, a sub-commander mm -hmm. of ASG that is under the leadership of Radula Sahiron, which was, you know, he's the commander, but you see sub-commanders coming out and trying to create their own identity their own path. That's why I told Matt the only time that the Islamic State will recognize Abu Sayyaf is if they go out of their usual operation. And then come come in 2017, Marawi city siege happened. And this is something really big, at least in the security landscape of the Philippines. It's changed, it changed things a lot. This is the only, um, after that, we started hearing Filipino suicide bombers for that matter. These are out-of-the-box scenarios that we, we, we usually encounter. So I hope I, we, we answer your question, Stephen. Anyhow, Miss Carmina Ilagan. Hello, Miss Carmina. Uh, good morning. Hello, good morning. Yes, hello, Matt. Um, thank you so much for all your sharing. I do have a question because I just uh, listened to Dia Khan. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She has a podcast on extreme listening. And she interviewed uh, one at one time jihadists and at another time, white uh, supremacists. Anyway, her conclusion, first of all, was that these people that join such organizations are good people, although in the eyes of many, they are bad. 
And uh, she also discovered that most of them join out of their brokenness, their need to belong, uh, which they can't find either in their families or among their peers. In your findings, do you share the same conclusion as her, that people here in the Philippines, in Sulu in particular, join such organizations because of the same needs, the need to belong, the need to be cared for. Uh, and these organizations actually uh, manipulate them and take advantage of their brokenness and uh, entice them to join the organization by really showing so much care for them. So I want to know if you share the same conclusion for these Filipino people that are here, that join well, these organizations. I definitely felt something like that about some of the recruits to the communist organization that I mm. met in, in Zimbales. And I remember there was a young woman, about 21 years old, who had been a waitress in Metro Manila and a student and, and struggling financially and mm -hmm. very, very upset and traumatized to an extent by the poverty and, and what she saw as the indifference to it. On a family holiday somewhere, she saw a poster up about a political discussion that night about mm -hmm. poverty in the Philippines and things. And she went to it and it was like a gradual recruiting thing for this armed group that mm -hmm. she then joined and is, um, was living in the mountains with then and as an outlaw and you know in armed clashes and everything to me she was sort of fitting fitting that but it was like the communists that i met they were the only people that i came across in the philippines at that stage who seemed to be asking the right questions about the philippines and about mm -hmm. poverty and and the terrible suffering of so many people and the you know lack of food and, and things and just yeah. like the Terrible. Social inequality. Yeah, yeah, social inequality. I think it's it's more of like personal and economic motivations. Come to think of it. Yeah. But the thing was, the communists to me had the wrong answers to the questions. Um, like they were the only people asking the questions. Their answer was that we need a revolution that we are in charge of, mm -hmm. and everyone like must fix. everyone must learn to think exactly what we say. Marxist Leninist yeah. thinking and so on. But in the in the Salu and Basilan, um, it didn't seem so much like people were leaving it for exploitative religious reasons, which was happening. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen, that people have been kind of misled into it. But it also, the element I came across, for example, was I interviewed once and met two farmers who were subsistence farmers. They Their crop, they sold their crop. They got ripped off. This is their version of it anyway. Like they did not get paid. So they kidnapped the merchant who was meant to pay them. Their Saif then uh, came to see them and said, we'll take over this now. We're, we're like, we do kidnapping here, not you. Mm. And they, these guys then were sort of press ganged or, or, or otherwise uh, incorporated into the Saif as a part of um, like kidnapping to supposedly safeguard small farmers and things and mm -hmm. but to them it was like the obviously for just uh, just part of the landscape it's like it's a landscape of armed groups whether it's the clans own the the you know vice governor tan that i met has two thousand armed men and, and armored vehicles and things um you know, sometimes you don't meet any police who actually work for the police. They, they're in the dresses, police, they're carrying their guns, but they're actually working for business or politicians. Um, so the obviously for like one faction there that is a bit rogue or others will say, no, it's not. It's a special yeah. operations group of the MNLF or something. It, it seems like people grow up so tough and hard in some places, mm -hmm. but for someone from Manila or or an urban part of Mindanao, where it's it's not that kind of rural poverty, lots of gun violence and armed. There's conflict. access. Mm -hmm. That becomes more like Carmina, perhaps more like where people are being um, radicalized and things. In the yeah. other area, it's like which which faction is going to protect you, which is offering what. Um, can you stay out of it even if you want to? You know, mm -hmm. or is it best to to be with one one of the groups. Yeah. Ms. Carmina? Yes, thank you for shedding light on this, Matt. I really appreciate it. Very interesting. Thank, 
Thank you. Thank and, you and very much. That, that radical listening is terrific. With the communists too, like they, they respect an argument, a discussion, you know, the whole thing's built on the engagement. dialectic. Yeah, yeah, engagement. So by disagreeing with them, but listening and not disagreeing, <laughs> out of it, but, but like just questioning, 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 right. like justify things, that, that sort of arguing. You know, we really moved through a lot of area about their ideology. And I remember the guy saying, the commander, the problem with the Philippines and the problem with life is that I look at that tree from here and you look at it from there and we're seeing two different trees because we have two different, two angles. different angles. Yeah. Philippines will be a great country where everyone get eat enough when everybody sees the same tree, same direction. the mm -hmm. same angle. And the implicit thing, which kind of came out a bit, but was that he knows the angle that we all must look from. And it, it's an error and a crime to see things from a different angle, you know? And that's why the communist forces purge themselves all the time and turn on each other, you know? And some of the strongest moments, the New People's Army, suddenly it's like, faction wars with people being mm. you know shot and tortured and you know just this paranoia about themselves and and mm. ideological purity that, that keeps crippling them you know mm. but mm. at least i could have an argument with them whereas um in in the south and stuff like I would not be hiking into the hills to go meet the WCF or anything. I'll talk to them on the phone or arrange a safe place or something. But but like the communists, not I, 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 can tr I felt there. I could trust them, you know, because right. they they want their message out there. The WCF, they don't really There's care. a conversation. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And yeah. when it comes to um, situations wherein they kill someone or they're behind uh, on, on some incident and they claim, they claim mm. that they're behind it and they explain why. Yes. But for some groups, sometimes they just tell they're behind it just to take True. the glory or something. Yeah. So somehow, yeah, I agree with you. I agree, I agree with what you said, Matt. Well, thank you so much, Carmina, for that question. And to all our audience, thank you for being such active listeners and participants. And we reach the last segment of our show. We call this Quick Talk. All right, Matt. So this is simple. We will basically just give you two options. You just have to choose one. So oh, okay. you, cannot, you cannot say it depends or you, you cannot refuse to answer. But don't worry, no explanation needed. You just have to give us what you think of about it. All right, are you ready? Where does it ever be? Australia or United States? United States. Singing or mm. dancing? Dancing. Writing or teaching? Teaching. My Colombian death or running with the blood god? Running with the blood god. Ice cream or cake? Ice cream. Writing in your desk or exploring field work? Field work. Hiking or swimming? Hiking. Investigative writing or nonfiction writing? Investigative. Now, this is not a quick talk. It's more of a question and answer. Most important thing you have learned after publishing three books. They're bad for your back. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> most important. Most important thing you, have, you can advise to someone after visiting four of the most interesting places in the world. To genuinely listen to people and to put yourself in other people's shoes and be open to someone else's life being as important as yours. That's a, that's a very good answer, Matt. Thank All you, right. Matt. Thank you so much, Dr. Matt. It thank was so nice much, talking to you. Thanks, Miles, and thanks, Eric, and thank you, all the listeners. I hope to get back to the Philippines sooner rather than later. Good night, Thanks. Matt, and thank Good you night. to everyone who tuned in and participated in Business Profiles Incorporated and Black Pearl Security Podcast, Simply Security. Well, we hope you that you enjoyed uh, today's session and learned something from, from it. We also wish to have you again next time. We are casting live every Wednesday, usually at 6.30 in the evening. Um, but you know just because math is on a different time zone so yeah. <laughs> and you can also catch the recordings of today's episode starting tomorrow on spotify google podcast and apple podcast podcast just type in simply security and of course to get the latest security information in the philippines and for any of our upcoming events do not forget to follow us on black pearl uh consultancy under linkedin that would be under information services. And you could also um, follow us via Twitter at blackpearl underscore INC. We'd also like to give special thanks to our production team, Gaia, uh, Jean Allen, and uh, Nina, and to our managing yes. director, Mr. Joseph Guedo, for making this program 
possible. Again, this is Miles. And this is Eric. This has been Simply Security. Helping you streamline security easily.